Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, presents the Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. When there's beer on your mind, your best thought is Schlitz, the beer that made Milwaukee famous. More people like the taste of Schlitz than any other beer. That's why Schlitz is the largest selling beer in America. And now, the Halls of Ivy. again to Ivy College. Autumn days filled with the excitement of the coming first snow and football and there's a zing in the air. But to Dr. William Todd Hunter Hall, president of Ivy and his ex-actress wife, Victoria, autumn means new students, a lot of new professors and receptions at Nauseam. As the lovely Mrs. Hall so well says, mm, I've had him to be sex and him. He was the fat one who teaches romance languages. About as romantic as little of us. Sex? Uh, what in the world are you talking about, Vicky? Oh, no, is this one? Oh, yes. He was the one with the bushy hair. He took four spoonsful of sugar. In his hair? Oh, no, sorry. I've only tried to see if we've had every new professor and instructor to see. Well, several of them have been here twice. Particularly Dr. Schwarzkopf in zoology, who looks like a sad bullfrog. <laughs> no, we haven't had all of them. Here's a name that isn't checked. John Bentley Brook. No, no, invite the bullfrog again, Schwarzkopf. I like him. He plays chess, badly. Well, who sent his book here? Have I met him? Mm, I don't know, Vicky. He's uh, modern English literature or some such. Doesn't matter. Well, he's the last of the lot. Shall we have him Tuesday? I'm busy on Tuesday. Wednesday? Uh, faculty meeting on Wednesday. Oh, that's news to me. You didn't tell me. No, dear, I just decided. Wait. Uh... <laughs> All right, Thursday, then. Uh, I, I never like these receptions on Thursdays. Well, why not? Well, it's, um, too close to the weekend, you know. Next day's Friday, then Saturday. It's confusing. <laughs> Certainly is. Well, well, what's the matter with Mr. Bentley Book? Don't you like him? <laughs> My dear girl, I, I don't know enough about the fellow to like or dislike him. Well, tell me, Tori, what does he look like? Well, I didn't notice, really. Lots of new instructors, you know. Can't remember details about all of them. When you engaged him, you must have noticed him. Well, he's a young man with the regulation number of ears and eyes, etc. Well, tell me a little more about the etc. Oh, no, no, Vicky. I, 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 Tori, I believe you're jealous. Jealous, my dear. I, I merely object to the new fad of young ladies making bird-like sounds because a person happens to be good-looking. Yeah, well, you never object when they make bird-like sounds over you. Oh, uh, that's nonsense. I'm not wolf bait. <laughs> or whatever the male equivalent of wolf bait might be. <laughs> oh, yes, you are. The toys on this campus coo and gurgle over you like bobby sock Well, of course they don't, Vicky. It's ridiculous. They certainly don't. Do they? <laughs> Miss Stormfield voted you the ivy man they'd most like to cling to. <laughs> Makes me feel like a bell tower. <laughs> now, I've got to be serious. We must have young Bentley book over. I'll keep that secret. I won't wear my bobby socks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, darling. Ask him whenever you like. Fine. Tuesday? I'm busy Tuesday. Where do you see? I told you, darling. Faculty meeting. Thursday? No, it's too close to the weekend. <laughs> Your pardon. Uh, is this Mr. Bentley Brooks' class uh, in modern literature? It sure is. And where did you see him? Is he dreamy? Mm, <laughs> sure he must be. Are you registering for his course, too? Not that I blame you. He'd have a full class if he taught counterfeiting. Did you ever see such a mob? Yes, but uh, I'm not here to take the course. I only want to ask Mr. Bentley Brooks to tea. Ask him to tea? Oh, a new approach. Well, that's just dull enough to be sharp. 
I got to try that. All right, everybody. Sign up. Fill out those slips. Go ahead, honey. Sign your name. No, no, that's, not, that's not what I came here for. <laughs> wanted to do was invite him to tea and get a look at him. Well, I've never believed that curiosity could kill a cat, but I'm beginning to think it might cause a few feline neuroses. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> now that you've been trapped into taking the course, I expect you to uphold the honor of this family and be an honor student. Oh, he doesn't know I'm the president's wife. I read this is under my maiden name. Well, you will still better pay attention and learn all you can because I'll be asking questions. Uh, what was the first lecture like? Well, Mr. Bentley Brook discussed the basic difference between T.S. Eliot and Nick Kenny. <laughs> basic difference, yes. Well, uh, on Friday, his subject will be, if Charles Dickens were alive today, he'd probably be writing comic books. Mm. <laughs> uh, apparently, Mr. Bentley hyphen Brook is a regular Milton hyphen Burl. <laughs> <laughs> he gets a lot of yacht. 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 I'm not familiar with the word. Y- yock, Y-O-C-K. It's a hearty laugh. A theatrical trade term. I can, I can see how it might have escaped your attention. Yeah. yeah. An interesting word. Have you any idea of its um, etymological derivation? Hmm? <laughs> yock. Yeah, yeah, it's possibly related to yoik, the cry of encouragement of fox hounds. <laughs> no, it's more a cry of appreciation to comedians. <laughs> I'm going to learn a lot about literature in this course. Yes, you'd better read a few books, too. Oh. You know, I disagree with that chap about Charles Dickens. I think he'd be writing daytime serials. Oh, Charlie. Yes. <laughs> Old Dr. Manette. <laughs> David Copperfield, boy, uh, boy. <laughs> Fagin, face his life. <laughs> oh, oh, gosh, that's wonderful. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I've gotten a few yucks myself. <laughs> and how about Dickens on television? Cook, Lafran, and Oliver Twist. Oh, yes. well, you're much better than Bentley Brook any day of the week. <laughs> well, I hope. I hope you weren't completely swept off your feet by the man's uh, look. Oh, Charlie, not for a second. Not for a single second. Second, he's not my type. You are. Yes, come in. Ah, Mr. Bentley Brook, isn't it? Come in, come in. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Uh, sit down, Brook. Uh, tell me, how is your course in modern literature progressing? Oh, very well, Doctor. I, I don't know when I've enjoyed teaching a course so much. Good, good. You know, it's my conviction that an instructor should be like a fine chef. Spice and seasoning are, of course, invaluable to every good dish. But, but the basic food must also be there. The meat, the potatoes. Nobody would care much for a steaming bowl of paprika or a platter full of cinnamon. <laughs> well, I, I agree with you, sir. Uh, mustard is all very well, but uh, the basic ham must always be there. Yes, in my case, it always is. <laughs> uh, now tell me, uh, what was it you wanted to see me about? Well, Dr. Hall, I, I wanted to ask you about, uh, well, uh, the, the rules regarding an instructor's conduct on this campus. Oh, we don't live by any hard and fast rules here, Brooke. The regulation thing, drive on the right side of the street... Honor thy father and my mother, and uh, and don't shoot any members of the board of governors between September and June. <laughs> well, I'll remember that. Uh, but by and large, we we try to live freely and fully, and that's only possible in an atmosphere of academic freedom. Too many thou shalt not, and the human brain becomes a tight little cell that is no longer an effective sending or receiving station. The soaring words of Socrates are on our bookshelf. Mr. Jefferson is there. Mr. Galileo. <laughs> and a young whippersnapper named Tom Paine. But unless we take them off the bookshelf and practice what they fought for, yes, and drank the hemlock for, well, we're not scholars in the true sense of the word. That would make a fine subject for a lecture to the student body, Dr. Hall. It's been used to Mr. Brook and by me every year. 
Well, the thing I wondered about is, uh, are, are there any thou shalt not uh, about an instructor falling in love with one of his students? An instructor falling in love with um, one of his students. Just, uh, oh, dear. <laughs> How do you feel about such a thing, Dr. Holmes? Uh, well, well, there are many factors to be considered. For example, is the instructor married or single? Conversely, is the student single or married? Well, uh... and then there's the all-important question, is the instructor male or female? And conversely, is the student female or male? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, business. There was only two sexes in the world it can get so complicated. <laughs> well, the instructor is male and single. The student is uh, quite female. And according to my class register, a myth. Well, this is a problem. And not an everyday one. Usually our professors are old enough to keep on their own side of their bifocals. And, and these students are young enough not to attract or be attracted by uh, wearers of bifocals. Uh, well, this student is quite mature. Unusually so. Really? Mature? Unusually. Yes, I see. <laughs> is, is there any rule prohibiting the instructor asking the student for a date? For dinner, perhaps? Or a drive in the moonlight? Uh, I'd like a ruling from you, Dr. Hall. I, I wouldn't want to do anything that might be bad form. Bad form, yes. <laughs> well, Mr. Brook, um, since this is such a, well, personal matter, I should like a time to think about it. And if you don't mind, I'd like to talk to my wife, you know, the feminine point of view. I, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting Mrs. Hall as yet, though I, I hear she's beautiful and charming. Well, I must say that's a very skimpy inventory of Mrs. Hall's quality. <laughs> Why, why don't you come to see this afternoon? You can meet Mrs. Hall, and we can all wrestle with your conscience. Oh, I should love you, Dr. Hall. Good. And that is the first act certain to a no-coward comedy if I ever heard one. <laughs> but uh, to, to file the teeth off an old saw, coward just makes consciences of us all. <laughs> When there's beer on your mind, your best thought is Schlitz, the beer that made Milwaukee famous. More people like the taste of Schlitz than any other beer. That's why Schlitz is the largest selling beer in America. Several thousand years ago, a fellow named Epicurus had a theory that pleasure is the only thing in life worth pursuing. <laughs> It's really too bad Epicurus can't be with us today. How he would have enjoyed pursuing the pleasure in a white-capped glass of Schlitz beer. That's pleasure in its purest form. To give Schlitz its own very special taste, the taste you remember with pleasure, Schlitz beer is mellowed three times. Mellowed by aging the barley till it's just right for malting. Mellowed by aging the malt till it's just right for brewing. Mellowed by aging the beer till it's just right for you. This triple mellowing is one of the reasons why Schlitz tastes so good. No wonder it's the largest selling beer in America. Dr. William Todd Hunter Hall is a man who faces issues squarely. Occasionally, of course, a few of the squares have rounded edges. Vicky is taking a course in modern literature from the youngest, the best-looking instructor ever to hit Ivy. As a husband and as president of Ivy, Dr. Hall is hitting back. Hello, darling. Oh, Vicky, I'm glad you're home. What's the matter? Vicky, do you mean that I have such an unpoker face that you can read it at a glance? <laughs> like a full house or a royal flushing heart. Uh, I, I shall certainly never play poker with you. Wives invariably have more extrasensory perception than is absolutely necessary. 
telepathy is only a scientific jargon for a woman's basic instinct. The gypsy fortune teller is only one who has put her feminine intuition on a paying basis. <laughs> now, I've no talent for it, dear. All I can ever see in the bottom of a teacup is tired tea leaves. Well, talking of uh, tea, were you planning to have anyone in this afternoon? Yes. I intended to have the best-looking, the wittiest, and the most charming man I know. You invited him? No, dear. You arrived pretty regularly without an invitation. Oh, me? Oh, no, 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 you. No, I, I thought you were talking about Mr. Bentley Brooks. Oh, Charlie, I've decided to forget about Mr. B.B. I'm dropping out of his course. I think you're right. We can forget about asking him. Forget? But you were the one who was so anxious to invite him. Well, at first I thought his lectures were fascinating, but I've changed my mind. He drones. He definitely drones. Well, he's going to drone for us this afternoon. I've invited him. <laughs> You've invited him? Whatever for? Because we are civilized, rational people who should face issues as they arise. What kind of issues? Mr. Bentley Brook is in love with one of his students. Oh, how romantic. I wonder who it is. <laughs> now, um, could it be the frizzed-out blonde in the front row who crosses her legs? No, I hardly think so. It, it might be the intense one with the straight hair and horn-rimmed glasses who doesn't cross her legs. Uh, Vicky, I have every reason to believe that it is neither the frizzed-out one or the horn-rimmed one. As a matter of fact, I'll come right out and say it's a married woman. Oh, dear. It does lead to complications. Yes. You've no idea how complicated it is. <laughs> the married woman is you. <laughs> but that's the funniest thing I ever heard. You're completely ridiculous. I was... <laughs> yes? In love with me? <laughs> My darling. <laughs> with me? <laughs> My darling, when a young man in his right mind huffs and puffs and carries on about moonlight rides, I do not diagnose it as asthma. <laughs> How do you know it's me? He as much as told me. What, to your face? Well, that is where people usually tell me things. <laughs> but he, he doesn't know that you're married. And he doesn't know that you're married to me. We're educating him to both those startling facts at tea. Well, it's a ghastly notion. It's like the second act of a bad play. My very words. Polite comedy. No yucks. <laughs> <laughs> I'll duck out. Severe headache. You tell him. Break his heart with my blessing. No, 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 no. You stay here, Vicky. After all, you created this situation. You were just too tantalizing in his classroom. Gosh, I wasn't tantalizing at all. I never opened my mouth. Silent women are the most intriguing in the world, my dear. The, the Mona Lisa speaks volumes. Well, I was no Mona Lisa either. Come to think of it, I did speak up once. I asked if I could close the window. It was drafty in there. You see, you tantalized him. <laughs> uh, according to that theory, a woman is deliberately tantalizing if she speaks up or shuts up. I don't think you have a very high opinion of women. On the contrary, Vicky, some of my best friends are women, including my wife and my mother. <laughs> well, I don't like women at all. I like fellas. <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure I approve of your use of the plural, but you're going in the right direction. <laughs> you remember the old Chinese legend of how women were created? No. Well, when Twashti, the creator wished to give man a helpmate, he found that he had used up all his materials creating men. So he fashioned a blend. He took the lightness of the leaf, the glance of the fawn, the gaiety of the sun's rays, the tears of the mist, the inconstancy of the wind, the timidity of the hare, and the vanity of the peacock, the harshness of the diamond, and the softness of the down on the throat of the swallow. The chill of snow, the warmth of fire, the cruelty of the tiger, the sweet flavor of honey, the chatter of the magpie, and the cooing of the turtle dove. 
He melted all these things together and fashioned woman. From that day forth, from that day forth, men have been unable to live without women and unable to live with them. As a representative of all the delighted and insulted women of the world, I thank you. You can. <laughs> Do you, do you remember the last time I was jealous of you? Oh, I certainly do. While you were courting me in London. It was that actor in our company who looked at me cross-eyed once or twice. You were furious. I don't even remember his name. Oh, I do. It was hyphenated. Colin Mumford Jones. And from that day to this, I haven't been able to abide a hyphen in a name. You know, I remember when I discovered that he wanted to make love to you off stage as well as on. It was that afternoon when we went to visit the National Gallery. Then you sulked. Oh, no, no, no. I... Amidst all those beautiful, immortal works of art, you sulked, Toddy. <laughs> every beautiful woman in every picture frame was you, Vicky. Oh, darling. I was ready to do battle against all my enemies, inside and outside the frame. It was one of those rare London days, do you remember? The sun in a clean blue sky, washed by an all-night rain. We walked from your flat all the way to the National Gallery. How do you like our National Gallery, Dr. Hall? It's a bit drafty, I'm afraid. I feel so sorry for some of Mr. Titian's reclining women. He didn't overindulge in overcoats, you notice. <laughs> oh. That is quite a picture. Ah. Cleopatra, Queen of Egypt. She looks just like you. That's a very sweet compliment. But do you think I brood that much? And are my eyes really the color of the Nile? The rivers of all the world do not match your eyes, O oh Queen of Egypt. I, the noblest Roman of them all, Julius Caesar, Rex Imperatus, tell you this. There is a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. And you are my fortune, Cleopatra. But what is that Marcus Antonius doing? Looking at you, cross-eyed. <laughs> uh, Marcus Antonius. Now, there's a hyphenated name if I ever heard one. <laughs> Let's move on to the next picture, Mrs. Caesar. <laughs> it too, Vicky. Uh, look, look here. Isn't she lovely? Anne Boleyn. Yes, Anne Boleyn, once Queen of England. The beloved, though temporary, wife of King Henry VIII. I suppose she looks like me, too. Ah, she lives in you. The fire, the magic. Well, you're not fat enough to be Henry VIII. Ah, to the headsman, woman. For you have betrayed me. Whilst I was busy signing documents with Cardinal Woolsey, eating a bare ten or twelve meals a day, you were philandering with Lord Rensselaer Twitchella. Rensselaer Twitchella. Now, there's another hyphenated name. <laughs> door, Toddy. But in the National Gallery, now that's ridiculous now, dear. How could that? Oh, 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 yes, yes, the door. Yes, it must be our guest. Where were you, Toddy? What were you daydreaming about? Oh, I was sulking in the National Gallery. <laughs> and now you've framed me again. Well, go on to the door. I'll set the tea things up in a perfect isosceles triangle. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, Dr. Hall. Oh, come in, Brooke. Uh, oh, no, it's uh, Bentley, Brooke, isn't it? Yes, uh, with a hyphen. <laughs> well, I, I hope I'm not too early. Oh, no, no, the triangle is all set, and I, I mean the tea things are all set. <laughs> it, it's so kind of you to take an interest in my problems. And... Why, Miss Cromwell. Um, may I present my wife, Miss Cromwell, to you, Mrs. Hall to me. Hello. Well, <laughs> well this is a surprise. Yes, we thought you'd be surprised. <laughs> Won't you sit down? Thank you, Miss Cromwell. Uh, Mrs. Hall. <laughs> well, I've known her in my classroom, and it seems a little strange. Suddenly, she's the president's wife. But of course, it didn't happen quite as suddenly as you might think. <laughs> now, <clears throat> we are all intelligent people, so I think we should come right to the point. Well, it's very kind of you, Dr. Hall, to concern yourself with my personal problem. But if it doesn't concern me, I'd like to know whom it does concern. Well, not every college president would be so considerate. 
Well, my dear sir, not every college president has a wife like mine. <laughs> well, I'm sure college life would be more wonderful if they did. Oh, why, Mr. Brooke, what a nice compliment. Uh, now, stop tantalizing, Vicky. <laughs> The, the coincidence of your wife's being in my class makes this a little easier. Uh, because, you see, she knows the young lady. Well, yes, I'm sure she... M I beg your pardon. She knows the young lady. Uh, it, it's Louise. Uh, Miss Turner. You know the blonde one in the front row who always crosses her... <laughs> the blonde one in the front row. The blonde one. Oh, the frizzed out blonde, eh? You know her too, Dr. Hall? No, no, no. Well, then, uh, I think you should meet her. Would you like to? Well, it would be one of the great pleasures of my life. Well, she's right out in the car. In the car? You see, after class today... Well, this is the most amazing coincidence. She came up and invited me to tea. I told her I already had one invitation, but she promised to wait. I don't mind two teas in one day at all. <laughs> I shouldn't wonder. Uh, you don't think it presumptuous of me to bring her along? Oh, by no means. And don't keep her waiting in the car. Have her come in. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Miss Turner? Louise? Won't you come in? You said it! <laughs> eh, well, Vicky, don't look so heartbroken. I've lost my touch. I'm no longer Cleopatra. Oh, lost your touch, my eyebrow. Why, I would have fallen in love with you no matter how much competition your husband was. Man has no taste. Makes me furious. <laughs> ah, here she is. Dr. and Mrs. Hall, may I present Miss Louise Turner. Hello, honey. <gasps> Jesus, you're Mrs. Hall. You can still call me honey. <laughs> oh, but Professor, she's the one who gave me the advice about asking you to tea. I didn't know exactly what you'd do at a tea. But I went ahead and asked him, and, well, <laughs> it worked. Very fresh personality, don't you think? Oh, yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Won't you come in? Well, we really should be running along. Uh, w one thing, Dr. Hall, you, uh, y you haven't said yet whether this is protocol, whether it's all right. I hereby make a new college rule. All professors may fall in love with all students be it spring or fall, be it the season of the nesting of the birds or the rising of the sap. <laughs> oh, thank you, Dr. Hall. Um, uh, well, one, one slight amendment. Both professor and student should, preferably, be single. Well, then it's all right. Goodbye, Dr. Hall. Goodbye, Mrs. Hall. You've been most kind. Imagine getting a peek inside the powerhouse. And I've only been here three weeks. By the time I'm a senior, I ought to be rooming here. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, we're, we're off. Uh, where would you like to go, Miss Turner? Well, uh, to tea, I guess. Uh, take her to the art gallery. Show her Cleopatra and Anne Boleyn. Oh, that's a good suggestion. Goodbye. 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 Well, I don't understand it. Why is it that brilliant, apparently erudite men invariably fall for frizzy blondes with giggles. But, darling, you're brilliant. You're erudite. Uh, oh, dear. I'll have to practice. Would you like to go to tea, Dr. Hall? <laughs> oh, the heck with the tea. Throw it out. Get me a bottle of beer. When there's beer on your mind, your best thought is Schlitz, the beer that made Milwaukee famous. More people like the taste of Schlitz than any other beer. That's why Schlitz is the largest selling beer in America. And now here again are Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Good, Good night, night, everybody. week at the same time at the Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. The other players were Sandra Gould, Ken Peters, Helen Crutchfield, and Mari Alden. Tonight's script was written by Lawrence and Lee and Don Quinn. Music was composed and conducted by Henry Russell. 
The Halls of Ivy was created by Don Quinn, directed by Matt Wolf, and tonight presented transcribed by the Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Ken Carpenter speaking. That's around us here today, and we will not forget, though we be far, far away. Now, enjoy the great Gildersleeve. Then it's Groucho Marx on NBC.